Um, the game design process, not so much, but I think as you, as you see from my talk, what I'm recommending here definitely doesn't go against a good game design process and might help tighten up your game design process. As a comparison, uh, I like to compare it to market research just to kind of set people's context um, because there's a lot of bleed over between the two. Uh, here's one definition of market research, the systematic collection and analysis of data regarding the prominent attributes of the market you are targeting. This information often includes data relating, relating to consumer behavior and competition. So again, we have research, systematic collection, and analysis of data. But this research is on the attributes of a market. And the focus is more on consumer behavior. So the market and the consumer. How do we get someone to buy this product? What are the opportunities within a particular market for this type of consumer? It's not so much about the experience interacting with the product dir directly. It's a little bit like all the things that come before you purchase the product and during the purchase experience. Games user research, as we've defined it, really starts once the player has the game in their hand and sits down to play it. Mm -hmm. There we go. So, and there's just a quick comparison. You've got user research, player behavior, the player's interaction with the game, and the experience, market research, consumer behavior, the market, and kind of sales. There's obviously some overlap. Um, a lot, there's many programs out there where the user research has come out of the marketing department. It's totally fine. Um, there's definitely some bleed over, especially when you get into things like, you know, what do, you, what do players prefer, which type of cars do they prefer, how many cars in a racing game, that type of thing. It can kind of bleed into the market research side. Um, but I'm really going to be focused more on the player experience side. Okay, so what does successful games user research look like? Um, basically, I'm stealing from a paper that Bill Fulton did back in 2002 for um, Gama Sutra, and he presented it at GDC. The paper's called Beyond Psychological Theory, Getting Data to Improve Games. And in that talk, he lays out four criteria for a good feedback system. Um, first is that it's accurate. Second is that it's timely. Third is that it's specific, and the third is that it's cost, or the fourth is that it's cost effective. I'm going to add one more thing that I think Bill was implying in this, but I'm calling out um, because when I walk through this example and how it actually works, I think that this is relevant to call out, and that is actionable. That the data you get is actually relevant to the product, and it's actionable. So let's walk through those. So accurate. Data is essentially, and I'm stealing this from Bill's talk as well. Data is, is like a road sign. It gives you some indicator of where you need to go, kind of what's going on with the lay of the land, and perhaps how you might want to correct to get there. But data is only helpful if it's accurate in what it tells you to do. Right? So it's, most of us would argue it's better to get no data than to go out, do experiments, and get bad data in return. Because if that happens, you might get direction like this, and you're probably better relying on your gut than following the bad data. It's timely. So it does you no good to find out that your level is too confusing, too long, and too complex when you've locked down geometry and all the art assets are in, and you know, you're two weeks away from, from shipping the product. The data has to come at a time when you can actually act on it and use it. Data needs to be specific. So I, as a user researcher, can tell you, hey, your game's too hard. What are you going to do with that? It's not helpful. I mean, is the game, is it that players don't know how to play? They're confused about the controls? Is it that the AI is too hard? Is it that they're getting lost? It's not helpful. So to share an example of specific, I actually pulled this from Halo 2. It's some work that Randy Pagulian did for Halo 2. To get specific, we need to break down the question. So to say the game's too hard is one level. Next level down might be, this mission's too hard. People are dying too often. Within that mission, we have a particular encounter that's too hard. All the deaths are happening there. 
Now we're getting a little bit more specific. I at least know where I need to focus. But if you can get even more specific in saying why that's happening, people are dying due to brute melee deaths, plasma grenade deaths, and needler shard deaths, now you've got some more information that you can actually act on. Now you know which levers to start pull pulling and playing with in order to actually fix the experience. And finally, is cost effective? Um, actually, not finally, finally for bills, but I've got one more. Um, this is Bill's example again. You could spend $100,000 to figure out that, hey, people prefer the second to the lightest shade of blue for their car rather than the lightest shade of blue for your car. You can do that, but it's probably not a good use of your money, and that's probably not a good feedback system. And then finally, the data needs to be relevant and actionable. So I can tell you things like 90% of your audience plays your games between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Data specific, I've given you time, I've given you the amount of the audience. It's timely, I could give this to you before you start development. Um, you know, I think it qualifies it's accurate, qualifies all the other things. But what do you do with this data? How do you act on this? There's really not much you can do with it. So that's why I've added this as a criteria to consider when we look at what makes good uh, games user research. Okay, so those are my five criteria. So why did I go through all of that? Because I want to talk, really now what I want to focus my talk on and the majority of my talk is what you can do before you even get to the testing part to ensure that the data when they come back are going to meet this criteria. So I'm going to walk you through the process um, that we try and use in Microsoft Game Studios to ensure that this, that this happens. Um, this process is a two-way street. It's not just for game development teams. It's not just for games user researchers. It's a joint partnership together. Obviously, some, as we break this down, some aspects, like I'll talk about it in a little while, defining your design vision is best suited for the, de uh, the development team. Other aspects, like figuring out which research method to run, are better suited for the game's user researcher. But it's still a two-way conversation, and it's that back and forth that will make your, uh, your title good through the game's user research process. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is understand game user research's uh, role in relation to game design. What I've done is I've put the criteria along the bottom, and I've highlighted those criteria that I think if you get this step wrong, you're going to have the most problems in this area. So it's really just showing how these relate. And also, if you're running games user research and you're like, yeah, the data doesn't seem very relevant, you can come back and you can look at this and be like, well, did we, did we get all of these steps right before we went into testing? Um, I've talked about uh, what, I, what I see games user research is. I'm going to be just really, really blunt and say a specific... I think games user research is there to support the game design process, not to dictate the game design process. So we can't um, sit there and say, this is what users are going to want. Um, or just build this and you'll sell a million units. It doesn't work that way and that's a good thing because it means all the creatives in this audience will have a job for a long time. Uh, it also means hopefully I'll have a job for a while. And the reason that this is true is because there's limitations on what humans can do. There's basic human limitations. Humans are good at two things uh, in, when it comes to kind of research. The first thing is that they can tell you, I like that or I don't like that. You put two things in front of them, or you put one thing in front of them, have them try it. Do I like that or not? They can tell you yes or no. It's a little bit more in the advanced games user research, but if you set everything up in the right way, you can also get it that they'll reliably tell you to what degree they like or not like it over time. But you can definitely put something in front of them and find out whether they like it or not. You can put two things in front of it and they can tell you which one they like more. That's kind of what they can do. They can't tell you when you show them something, I don't like that, and this would make that thing so much better. I mean, they can tell you that, and some of them will tell you that, but I've been doing this for 10 years, and let me tell you, your customers are shitty game designers. There's no way around it, no matter, no matter how good they think they are. Um, so they'll pretty much say, sure, I want, you know, I want more ammo. I want more, you know, I want to be able to carry more weapons at once. I want to be able to do this or that. 
but that may not make a, a good game. So you can't rely on them for that. And I think that's fundamentally what's blocking, what's always going to block uh, research from dictating game design. The second thing that they can do is that they can behave. They can show you how they play the game. They can show you the experience that they're having, and you can watch that experience and learn a lot from that. So there's really two paths. You can get the attitude or you can get the behavior. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the second step, once you understand that these are the limitations, this is what we're going to have to deal with, um, this is the role that user research is going to have in game development, is that you need to clearly articulate the game vision. So, you know, the classic saying, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it. The same is true with research. If I, as a researcher, if I do a study for you on your game, and I don't understand what you want to accomplish with your game, I'm not going to do a very good study. And you're definitely going to see issues around relevancy when I come back with the results. Um, you may see a few issues with accuracy, uh, maybe issues with specificity because I don't know exactly what you're focused on. So the way to get around that is to clearly articulate the design vision. The next thing you need to do, so the design vision might be something like, we want to showcase the power of the Xbox. Somehow I've heard that one before. Um, it's a fine design vision. It's just like, what do I do with that as a, as a researcher? Remember, games user research is about the interaction between the player and the game. So we have to phrase the design vision and our design goals in terms of that experience between the player and the game. It's hard to test a player without that being clear. And if you don't do this, that's where you get the, you'll get a lot of issues with sort of accuracy because things are just all over the board, right? My opinion of what really pushes the power of the Xbox may be different than Randy's opinion, may be different than Matt's opinion, may be different than Bill's opinion. And you're just not going to get very actionable or accurate data. The next thing is that you need to be specific. Um, and by the way, I'm going to go through examples of all of these. We're going to go through a case study at the end. Um, but it's really taking, you know, that. Th so you've got the interaction. Now you've got to say exactly what's happening. So I gave you the example of Halo 2 and sort of how it looked specific on the back end. But you need to do that same level of specificity on the front end when you're planning the test. So for example, you may say, I want to know if my game is fun. Okay. I'll tell you the answer. It's usually, yeah, somewhat, a little bit. Uh, tends to be, especially early in development. Um, but if you start to break it down, say, what about my game? Am I, what components of the game are we trying to build together to make fun? Is it story? Is it combat? Is it exploration? Is it graphics? Um, all of these things clearly work together. So now we're getting more specific. And a researcher can take this information away, and they can look at it and say, OK, well, you want me to tackle story, that's at least a little bit more specific. Or you want me to tackle combat. And the more that we can break this down, say combat is an encounter, a single encounter with some AI and some enemies in a firefight, and then it's the flow of those encounters amongst each other, now there's another level deeper that we can start to look at. And if you break down an encounter further, there's such things as tactics. So are players using the right tactics that we intended them to do? AI, how's the AI responding? Is it doing what the player expected? Is it doing the things that the player perceives as smart? Or is it doing things that the player perceives as stupid? Uh, how are the weapons working? Are they engaged, is the player engaging from the right distance? Are, you know, do the players seem weak? Why or why not? That sort of thing. So it's only once you start to break it down from the top that you get very then clear guidelines for what your test is going to focus on. And then you translate this into researchable questions. So this is a pretty meaty part, and it's a part that I'm going to kind of dance around. Like I said, they're going to be talking about methods later. So I chose not to go deep into this area. But if you don't do games user research, I think that there's really kind of two, well, one level of dichotomy um, that's important to know. There's probably a second one that I'm not going to go into because it gets a little more advanced. But it's really about behavior or attitude. And I 
This is why I alluded that to this earlier. Players can tell you what they think, or they can show you their behavior. So if you can kind of break down your questions into, will they best be answered by watching someone or by asking someone? That's kind of the first step to breaking down a question into uh, a researchable question. And behavior, that's going to answer questions like what or why. So if a player says the game's too hard and you watch them play and you see that they're being killed by the brutes all the time and you see that they're sneaking up behind them and the player doesn't realize they're behind him and they're giving them the melee attack, it tells you what's going on and it also tells why. On the other hand, attitude will help tell you which one, which ones, and how much. So which weapon do you prefer? Um, you know, how much, how much, how difficult is this? Is it too difficult? Not difficult enough? Those type of things. And again, really breaking that down into a test design then, there's several more steps there, but I think that that's a good start. And then you need to work to find a way to get the answers while minimizing impact on development. Again, this is where the timely and the cost-effective uh, issue comes in. Again, we'll come back to an example of this later, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Finally, well not finally, the next step is to conduct the research with the right audience in the right way. And this here is probably why we spend a lot of time talking about research methods, because if you notice, every criteria for good feedback is on this line. Uh, this is the point at which you can screw up uh, any one of these aspects. You can take too long to do the research. Um, you can do it in a bad way that doesn't give you specific examples. Um, you can do it in a really expensive way, that sort of thing. But if you work through this process on the front end, it's really going to help you set up so that you know exactly how to apply the research on the back end. And the next is to analyze and act on the results. And then rinse or repeat as much as you can. All right, so I'm going to give an example um, so that we can walk through this and kind of make this more real. Uh, let's say that you're making a mobile jewel matching game. Uh, apologies if there's anyone from PopCap in here. I just was looking for a game that everyone would be familiar with. But let's say you're making some sort of game like this, but you want to make it for a mobile device. Okay, so I'm going to skip the understand GER's role in relation to game design. Hopefully I made that clear. The next step is to clearly articulate the game design. So I'm just going to make something up. Let's say that this is what the designer or the producer says is the goal. I want it to be easy to play. I want it to be optimized for mobile play. I want it to be fun. And I want it to have the best mobile graphics. Okay, pretty simple. What we need to do though is take those four things and translate um, that into player experience. That process can be fairly easy. Uh, just start out with a sentence that says, players will. So it's easy to play. Players will quickly know how to play this game. It's optimized for mobile play. What does that mean? That, this one is a little bit more where you've got to spend some time thinking about what does it really mean for the player experience to be optimized for mobile play. Could be that they're going to be able to play the game on the go. They're going to be able to have a good experience, say, when they're on the bus playing playing the game. Fun? Ah, players will enjoy playing the game. And the best, best mobile graphics? Players will think the graphics are better than any other mobile game. So we've kind of brought it down a level, but if you read those, they're a little unsatisfying. I mean, players will enjoy playing the game? What does that mean? How do I act on that? So the next thing we need to do is make those more specific. So players will quickly know how to play. Players will understand the goal of the game within the first 15 seconds of playing the game. Players will know how to uh, swap and move jewels and match them within the first 30 seconds of play. Now we've got more specific things. And as you look at it, I hope that it sort of hints at, well, this is what I need to do to find out if that's happening or not. Hopefully it paves the way to, to the research method. Players will be able to play the game on the go and have a good experience. You know, players will be able to respond to interruptions within five seconds without losing points or uh, their game progress. It's a mobile game. It might happen in a mobile environment. We need to support that. 
Uh, players will be able to play without the sound. They might be playing it on the bus and not have headphones, etc. Fun. Uh, players will play the game in a way that creates a good experience. Uh, this may be a little bit of a twist, and this was one of the tips and tricks that I had for my original talk, so I thought I would slide it in here. And that is, I've seen a lot of people get very hung up on the concept of fun, and is the game fun, and is the game fun, and is the game fun. The problem is, is that the fun of the game doesn't come in until very, very late in the development process. So I think a more constructive uh, method, especially early in game design, is to think about are the players playing in the way that I've designed it to be optimally fun? Because if they're not, odds are they're not having as much fun as you want them to have. So first get over the hurdle of making sure players are playing the game in the way that you think is fun. Once you've gotten over that, then you can start uh, worrying about questions of measuring fun. I think you'll find by the time you get over that first hurdle, there's not a lot of time for the second uh, thing as well. Um, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean there's no such thing as emergent gameplay or that you shouldn't strive for that, but I think even emergent gameplay you can break down into building blocks that support emergent gameplay and then do testing to see whether people are discovering those building blo blocks and using those building blocks in the way that you intended. So when I hear, oh, I, don't, I don't know what makes it fun, you know, the player will figure that out, that's, that's ridiculous. I think we'd all say that that's ridiculous. Uh, you could also do an attitudinal thing. So players are going to give this a six or more on a scale of one to seven, whatever that means. Graphics. Players will think the graphics are better than any other mobile game. Again, what do you mean by graphics? Is it the static graphics? Is it the animations? Is it the art style? Um, those things matter. It matters. It's going to affect the way you do testing. It's going to affect what the user researcher looks at. So you've got to get specific on what you're looking for. Then we translate those into researchable questions. So earlier I talked about there's behavior and there's attitude. A good first step is just to break those into how can I answer these questions? Do I want to look at, can I look at behavior to answer it? Can I look at the player's attitude or opinion to answer that? Um, so the player will understand the goal of the game. Behavior sounds pretty good to me. You can watch. You can see whether they understand the goal. But you could also have the player tell you whether they understand the goal. Yep, I understand the goal or I don't understand the goal. All right, so either one would work. Will they know how to match gems? Same thing. Either one will work. I'm probably just going to go through these pretty quickly. Yep, you know, I can play the game without sound. I can report that. Or I can watch someone and I can see, yep, they played the game without sound. Either one works. They'll rate the mobile experience as good as the computer experience. That's an attitudinal thing. I don't know how to capture that with, with behavior. It's a rating. That's the same thing. Again, rating on a scale, that's attitude. They'll play the game in a way that creates a good experience. That's probably going to be behavioral. Um, it's going to be very, very hard for players to tell you how they actually played the game in any way that's going to be helpful to you at all. Okay, just going to skip through. All right, so once you've done all of that, so now we've got, okay, we've got all our questions. We've got our, we've got, um, yeah, we've got our specific design goals. Uh, we've got the way that we want to tackle them. Now we need to find a way to get the answers while minimizing impact on development. Um, I see this as two parts. This isn't necessarily about finding a way to do, well, I'm going to get to it later. It's about finding a way to do uh, user research cheaply and quickly and at the right time. But I think that there's another element to this as well, and that is remove any unactionable options right now. Um, you can waste a lot of time running tests to get answers that you get them back and you're like, I have no idea what to do with that. And even if you throw it in with another test that has a lot of actionable stuff, you're still wasting time developing that part of the test. You're wasting time analyzing it on the back, back end. So just get rid of those questions to start with. Um, so do a quick call. So if we look at all our attitudinal research questions that we've put together through this process, players will understand the goal of the game within the first 15 seconds. 
So how are we going to do this? We're going to have players tell us after 15 seconds whether they understand the goal of the game. What if the player says no? What are we going to do with that? It's not clear what we're, we're going to do when we get that response back. But if we watched the player play the game and we understood what they were trying to do, an easier example might be how they moved the gems, we can see where they clicked in what process they tried to move the gems? Did they click one place and then another? Did they do a slide? Did they try and move it clear across the board? Um, did they skip the instructions that told them how to do it? Did they misread the instructions? All of those things give us a lot more insight in how to actually fix the game in order to, uh, make it to accomplish this goal. So for that reason, we could probably knock out uh, the first you know, four yeah, the first four of these. In addition, um, the last one, players will rate the graphics as better than any mobile game they've played before. What are you going to do if they don't? What, if they're gonna, what do you do if, if they say, you know what, it's, it's the third best mobile game I've ever seen? I mean, odds are you have limited time, limited budget. You're doing the best graphics that you can do. You're not going to act on this data. So don't spend time collecting the data. It's just going to randomize you. It's just going to be more things to get in. If you're not going to use it, don't worry about it. Now, if you're, if you're doing some sort of, say, um, uh, depth of field, what's it called, level, level of detail work in a game where you've got two different algorithms for how you, you know, pop in level of detail and you want to see which one is perceived as making better graphics, then by all means test that because there's direction and there's action out of it. But if you're just, you know, we spent our art budget and we're kind of done. Don't bother running the test. So when you break that, when you get rid of all those, we're kind of just left with two things. Uh, players rate the game as fun as the PC version. On a scale of one to seven, players will give it a six or more. Those are fine questions, especially if you can create some action out of them. But we've culled the list. Um, behavioral research. Kind of talked about all these uh, when I was talking about the attitudinal stuff. Um, all of these kind of stand, make sense. Doesn't mean behavioral research is the best way to go, but I do think it's, again, the right starting point. Because, again, it doesn't make sense to ask players what they think about the experience until you know what experience they're actually having. And finally, once you've gotten rid of all the questions, and you've got really focused on those questions that are actually going to make a difference for your product. Test early and test often. So if you're interested in things like fun, how can you do this, especially when fun comes in so late in the game? Find out what's fun about similar games. Find another game that's similar. Um, you know, we do tests when we're introducing a new control scheme in a game. We'll do a test where we'll find a competitor title with a similar control scheme, and we'll test that. And we'll see what works for players and what doesn't work for players so that before anything's built, the design team has a list of, like, here's how it's going to go when you build this control scheme if you don't account for these factors. Players are going to have this problem, this problem, and this problem, and it's going to happen in this way, this way, and this way. And it's going to take them this long to learn this and that long to learn that. Once you have that, especially before you start building, it gives you the opportunity to build the right thing uh, in the right way the first time. And then maybe, you know, you get the first playable in, and there's no instructions, and there's, you know, and a lot of the other things aren't in. Well, you tell them how to play, or you provide kind of pseudo instructions for them. And you can start to get some feedback then by either watching them play, seeing what they're enjoying, what they're not, kind of what they talk about, that sort of thing. Understanding how to play, how to get them to, um, you know, how to make sure that they understand the goal in the first 15 seconds, that they know how to play in the first 30 seconds. Paper prototypes, mock this up. Don't worry about having the full thing in the game. Um, when we were working on Connect titles, if you're familiar with Connect Sports, the way that that works is um, the way that the instruction happens there. So before you go into the mini games, there's usually only a couple of motions that you really need to know. So it's okay to go ahead and just teach that up front. And so that's what we did, is we wanted to figure out how to teach that up front. We didn't build all the art assets and do all that and put it into the build and then test it. What we did instead was we started with, let's do some written instructions on paper. Or let's you know, put some text into the build before they go into the game. Let's see how that goes. Eh, it's not going that well, because it's really hard to convey motion 
with text. So we need some animation. All right, well, let's get the developer to sit in his office with a webcam and do running and javelin throw, and we'll throw that in the build to see if that's effective. And that's what we did. And it was effective and entertaining. <laughs> and then once we got that working, then we could move into, okay, we know it's working. We know what we need to do. We know the exact instructions. We know the exact length to show them. We know the amount of time that they need to, to practice the gesture. Now let's go ahead and build it. And then conduct the right research with the right audience in the right way. And I am going to maybe undercut the methods talk later in just a little bit by saying you don't need fancy labs. Uh, these are Microsoft's fancy labs. They're very nice. Uh, it's one of the perks of working there. Um, what you really need, you just need your target user who's happy to come in and help you out. Um, and that's not that hard to get. You can, uh, you know, you can get friends of friends as a starting point. Um, you know, there's plenty of market uh, research agencies out there that will uh, recruit target profiles for you. When I was in Australia, this is what I did. It cost me, I mean, I don't know what the market is here, but it cost me 60 bucks a participant for them to go out and recruit someone. To find gamers is not very hard for them, so it shouldn't be terribly costly for you. And you need a conference room. That's all you need. And you, well, you need your build and a TV or a PC or whatever and that sort of thing. And you probably need some patience and you need some thick skin and you need the willingness to sit there and listen and not open your mouth because they're going to do things and say things that are going to drive you nuts. And you're going to be like, how are you missing that thing that I designed that I put there that, so that you could find it and now you're not seeing it at all. Um, and again, this isn't about all the methods, but I think uh, there are some basic things of just sitting down and watching a player play especially early in the process that can give you a lot of insights. And if you've done all of these other steps so that you know exactly what you're looking for, you know exactly what you're trying to get out of this study, you can get an effective test that will allow you to analyze and act on the results and will hopefully encourage you to rinse and repeat and do more of this in the future. So that's it for me. Um, questions? Um, we do. Um, to be totally honest, the biggest benefit of videotaping is to be able to share with others afterwards. To go back and analyze the video, they say it's something like two to four times the amount of video that you have. So an hour will take you two to four hours to go back and reanalyze the video. So we try and capture as much as we can in real time. That means we, doesn't mean we never go back, but the real benefit is you see something and you can take it to a team member and, you know, show them and that is a lot more effective than me trying to explain especially very subtle details um, or when there there you know there may be situations where it's just like I don't know what's happening here something weird is going wrong and to sit back and rewatch that a few times is helpful Scott, I love your uh, relevance point but I find that it doesn't work okay <laughs> I mean I find that it, you know they really want to know about the art style, and you ask them why. They say, because <laughs> <laughs> I invested all this in it, and we need to get a good read, or whatever their yep. their, their reasoning is. Yep. Have you had any luck um, or any strategies for being persuasive on that point of trying to remove things that are not actually useful? Sometimes, and sometimes not. Um, it's a real challenge, and. I think the reason that I brought it up here is that I'm really thinking about people who are starting out in games user research and those are giant traps that are going to take your time and end up, you're going to do a lot of work, you're going to come back to the team, you're going to say, okay, I got your data on how the graphics look and they're going to be like, yay, I got data. But after a while they're going to be like, well, I didn't really do anything with that. I didn't do anything with that. I didn't do anything with that. Um, Bill is actually pretty good at this. Um, you should know, know that. Um, he would say, okay, so I'm going to get this data for you. Uh, here's the scale I'm going to use. I'm going to use, let's say, five point to make it easy and to just rub it into Bill. 
That's a user research joke. Um, what, if the, what if the graphic score comes back with a three? What are you going to do? They'd be like, oh, well, you know, then we might have to invest a few more resources in our graphics or something. No, 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 no. What are you going to do? I want to know what you're going to do. This is going to take time and resources. I need to know how you're actually going to act on this. Well, if it's a three, then maybe we need to go back to where we're outsourcing it and get them to, to fix it. Okay, do you have budget for that? Uh, no. Um, and then to, you know, show them, hey, but this other thing you're interested in, I can get you good data on that. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, every method is different. So sometimes you can play the game of, hey, we can't do that with this method. Don't look over, you know, don't look over here. But it is a real challenge, and I think, I think it's a threat. And honestly, as a mature organization at Microsoft, I think it's a threat for us still. Um, and it's something that we struggle with. Because we've got, everyone has limited resources, and we want to make sure we're applying it to those things that are actually going to move the needle for the customer experience and for the game design. So yeah, it's easier said than done, but I think it's important. Cool. Uh, do you have any experience with the biofeedback and reporting user information? I don't have any personal experience with that. Um, I think that that's going to come up later today, isn't it? Is it, is it you? It's Are you Mike? I'm no. Mike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, come to the, is it the third talk, Joho? It's the third talk. Um, I believe Mike Armbender is doing some of that research. Yeah. Am, Ambender. Like Armbender. <laughs> Ambender. <laughs> I, I have my opinions on it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the, the panel kind of work that stuff out. Um, and that would be, I mean, for me, the big things are cost effective and timely. Um, I mean, if people found a way to do it quickly and then actionable and interpretable, um, you know, I think that there may be potential for that. Um, I haven't seen it done in a way that would fit within the development cycles that I work um, in sort of to the level that some of these cheaper methods and faster methods have. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, I, at the last Gerr Summit, one of the problems with this relevancy for the design team or to take, you know, make, make the data, data analysis that you yep. take so much time to prepare you know, relevant and actionable. So you, are, you explain kind of the design vision, how the, the team explain what that vision is, and then where you go through steps to develop, you know, uh, research questions based off of attitudes and behaviors. Yep. So at what point, maybe if you can give an example, do like the designer's eyes glaze over? Like what plot, like what step are, do they kind of, you go into oblivion and they're not kind of understanding where you're going? Or are they with you the whole time and they, I mean, is it different per, per team, I guess? It is different. It is definitely different um, per team and it's sort of like what Kevin alluded to. You'll have some teams that are just like, well just tell me if my game's any good. And like, well, I don't, I don't know what to do with that, right? So they're stuck on kind of step two. They haven't clearly articulated the, the design vision for you. Um, there's other teams that will go all the way down. Um, one of the reasons, uh, like you saw Rand, uh, the graph that I showed for Randy of like, here's the mission, here's the level, here's the encounter, here's the result, is that Bungie would lay out, they would tell you exactly what they wanted to happen every step of the way. So they were there with you to that point. They're like, they're saying, okay, we want this encounter to be hard and we want this one to be fairly easy. And once they do that, then it's very easy, like, it's almost not a step for you to go out, get the data, come back to them, and then the conversation is, here was our goals, let's go through and check it. We've got one development partner that we work with and the reports that we send back to them are literally a list of questions and answers, and it's questions that they've defined ahead of time. You know, will users understand how to play the game using the videos that we created? We say, yes, they were, or no, they weren't, and here's why they weren't, kind of thing. Does that? That, that, that makes sense. That's yeah. Cool. Um, do you have any suggestions for like what a, a minimum sample size should be? <laughs> Depends on your question. So, um, if you're looking at, how do I do this in a really quick way that doesn't make every user researcher in here cringe? Um, you need. Uh, so yeah, you're cringing on it, it's fair. Um, depending on the question, you need one. You need one person. So 
And, and there's a very specific, uh, there's specific situation where that's true. And that is where you're looking at behavior and you're trying to detect problems that people might have with the game. And when you only need one person is when that person comes in and they read the instructions that you've given them and they interpret it one way and you look at the instructions and you say, well, no, duh, I totally wrote that vague and ambiguous and it's really easy to change. I'm going to change that. You know, you don't need to wait to see 500 people get confused by that, that question. Um, so you just need one. And we do testing. If you look it up, uh, Michael Medlock did a paper called Write Testing, where he, uh, it's R-I-T-E, uh, Write Testing, Rapid Iterative Testing and Evaluation. And he basically argues for that, that you should run these short tests, watching behavior, seeing where confusion happens. And if it's an easy fix, make the fix right away. If it's a costly fix, then you might want to wait and run a few more people and see, was this person just crazy? Or is this going to be an, an ongoing issue that we need to address? Once you get into attitudes, then it totally depends on test design. It depends on things like power and variance and a whole bunch of other things that come into play. And that becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, we push that pretty hard for the same reason that the, uh, you know, having the videotape. It's the most persuasive thing. It's also the, I mean, what's better to act from, from a game designer point of view, to see the problem happening in the context in which it happens or to hear me tell you about it later? Um, so we definitely encourage that. Um, we're also lucky in our facilities and our support. We're able to stream the sessions throughout the company. So a designer can be sitting at his desk watching a usability session while he works on on other things. Um, so we've got a couple of options there for uh, the developers. And obviously when we're doing when we're doing this right testing and doing rapid changes, we want to have the designers, the decision makers, and the developers right there in the lab so that we can make the changes very quickly and move on to the next participant. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason the reason I did my weird neck thing on the focus testing is that um, there is a role for focus groups. Um, it's more in, in my opinion, in idea generation and that sort of thing. When you try and evaluate in a group setting, what tends to happen is that there's one person who speaks very loudly, and they kind of dominate the opinion, and other people follow along. So at Microsoft, we have people in their own, when we're doing the attitudinal research, we have people in their own uh, cubes. They have headphones on. They're answering on an online questionnaire. They're not talking to one another. So it's totally isolated. Now, we may do behaviorally. We usually do one at a time only because it's hard to observe two different people doing something. But obviously, if we want to see the behavior of social interaction within a game, then it might make sense to observe groups of people. Um, we use a system called DATSTAT, which is um, commercially available. Um, I've used SurveyMonkey, though, in Australia when I had a much more limited budget, and it seemed to work just fine. Um, like I said, this is really a back and forth, and I think it is kind of on us to, to kind of push back and, and kind of work back and forth. Um, sometimes teams will do design pillars, and that's a good starting point, so that they will kind of break down these are the main things that we want to accomplish in this game. Um, some of it's just a conversation, so I'll break, down, I'll break down the game for them, and I'll say, okay, it looks like your game has these components. Which of these is the most important component for your game? Why? You know, what is the thing that's going to make you different? Why? What is your biggest concern in the game? 
What thing are you most worried about when you look at this? But to actually go to them with the breakdown, not to say this is the most important thing for your game, but here sort of that, that, that first level of uh, the breakdown when I gave the fun and the components that make up the fun. Get them talking at that level, see if you can get them down a level. And then once you've kind of identified the hot spot, then break that down and say, okay, now we're at this level, what's most important? But it is the most difficult thing, and it, honestly, it, it's where I feel that you get a lot of separation between, that's usually the point at which I know we're gonna have a really successful relationship or it's gonna be not so successful. words, they're going to speak in, in, in however language they want, and once you get them very uh, in, in a place where they're comfortable, start mocking up fake data versions and, and giving it back to them and saying, okay, you said, and Joe will remember this one, you said you want the juxtaposition between dark and light for a halo mission, and then you go back and, and say, okay, if I were to collect data that just looked like this and said this and completely made up. Um, would that get close to what you're talking about? Is that what chaos means to you? Is that what balls to the wall means to you? Um, <laughs> and then they, you start a dialogue, but the, I think the critical components of that technique is let them use whatever language that, that they want to use because that's where they're most comfortable. Then you start mocking up versions, your versions of it for them before you collect any, any data. Uh, to, to, okay, Brent used the word mock, and I continue that. <laughs> um, often what really spurs the, what I would call the lazy designer who just wants to say is it fun as opposed to actually think of what that really means, is create a really, really bad measure. <laughs> oh, fun means takes time within the first seven seconds. Well, no, 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 that's just ridiculous. Yes, but ridiculous is you can't define and articulate what fun is. So, you know, it's not to say that bad, but taking the approach of, but if you are going to be that lazy, then I'm going to be that lazy as well. And what you're going to get is a ridiculously bad measurement that says your game is not very fun. And furthermore, it's going to be unactionable, unuseful use of data. So it's a little more confrontational version of mocking. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that for, for certain personality types, it works amazingly well because they hate lazy thought that you do, even though they're kind of being lazy on their own. So I think we're out of time. We can, we can do one more. Yep. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, it's good to sort of start off by trying to make sure that people are playing the game in the way that you intended it to be fun. And then afterwards, once that's done, then test to see whether it actually is fun, whether those mechanics are actually working. Um, you were worried that all that effort going into making sure that people are playing it the way you intended to be played, um, if it turns out not to be fun at the end of the road, you just wasted a lot of time. Um, I think I would say that that's true of you know game development without consumers, right? Is that you spend time internally play testing it and trying to get it fun and you know tweaking various things and building levels and you know all this energy goes into it and you're not going to really know until the end if it's if it's really congealed together. And I think the same things that happen in, in traditional game development internally happen with customers as well. Is that you see hey, this thing seems to be working out, or you start to get these hints of like, man, people just really aren't getting this, or, you know, yeah, they're playing it in the way, but they don't seem really into it, you know, that sort of thing. And I think, yeah, you'll see that. The question is, what do you do about it? Um, and, you know, that's, that's the struggle of game design, and I'm not sure that, that research actually would solve that problem one way or the other. For me, it's always just hard because the developers will usually come back, and that's underlying <clears throat> why they're asking to get good measures of fun in the first place. And I want to know whether these things are actually working in terms of actually developing the experience that I want them to have. Right. And I think, you know, that's why we've always been careful about saying, look, we're not, we can't show you the path to fun. Right? We can help ensure that the vision you have for the game is realized. That's what we can do. If your vision's off, yeah. Um, I did a similar talk to this in Australia, and I actually had that bullet point in there as, you know, pluses and minuses of games user research. And the answer was, if your vision's off, it's not, 
Now, it might help you course correct. It might get you some data early that you can go, ooh, it feels like we're going down the wrong path. Maybe we'll correct. But if it's just totally off, I mean, I've worked on games that, I've worked on bad games. All the work that I did didn't make them better. You know, I don't know. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, are we rolling right into the next talk? Okay.